you know, for example, people talk about Hodgkin's and there's a cure rate overall of way north of 90 percent, which is terrific in terms of cancer, but not so good for the five or 10 percent. So working and continuing uh, helps. But when we see the progress and for all forms of lymphomas, we've seen progress it translated into patients living longer and more patients uh, not just living longer, but actually having cures. Uh, and the other thing I tell people is years ago with cancer, if you lived a couple, three years, you bought yourself a couple, three years. But now with the developments in the, the past eight, ten years, you're not only living that additional time, but you're buying yourself time to get to that next treatment and the treatment after that because that's the pace of research now. It's really quick. It is. And, and there's different types. There's other lymphomas that you're intimating at that are more chronic indolent where you can treat it, but it's not curable. It'll go into remission for three, four, or five years and then come back, give another treatment. But with the Burkitts, that's one, it's kind of all or none right at the beginning. You want to cure it, put it behind you, never have to deal with it again. Now, I may have this wrong, but I think there's multiple types. And uh, it's some of those types, in some instances, whenever you, you ask doctors what causes it, you sort of get the, well, we're not sure. But in the case of some forms of Burkitt's, we know some of the causes, don't we? Yeah, we do. And, and it is tricky. And we have to invoke the lawyer rule and say, it's, we don't know. But that, that is the honest answer of someone. And it's a common question. I would say almost every patient. And it's a absolutely fair question that, that we get asked, what caused this? And th there's a lot of theories. It's not without research. Mm -hmm. And and it's true for lymphoma, not just lymphoma, but many cancers. And I, and I think part of it is, is because there's not one answer. It's probably a whole multitude of different things. Partly the genetics in the body, partly exposures, partly viruses. And so in Burkitt's case, it actually was, was uh, described by a Dr. Dennis Burkitt many decades ago, and he described it in Africa. And this is something that's seen in, in the African type. There's actually different types throughout the world. There's a, a, a U.S., what we call sporadic type, it's called endemic, where it actually is not uncommon in Africa, and, and what's very common in almost every African endemic case is they find Epstein-Barr virus is related. And we say, well, let's Epstein-Barr, that's mono, a lot of people. And so that's the tricky part, is not everyone who has Epstein-Barr virus develops lymphoma or Burkitt's lymphoma, but it's part of the puzzle. And so that's a whole, it's called epidemiologic research. And we have researchers in Chicago believe it or not, who are not just epidemiologists in cancer, but they're lymphoma epidemiologists. And it's trying to put all those puzzles together. Okay, if it's part virus, part genetic, it, how can we put that puzzle together? And it's hard, though, because you're kind of going back in time and trying to research that. But there's been some headway. Clearly, a lot more needs to be done in terms of epidemiology and lymphoma. And I want to get into the research, but one final question for Burkitt's, which is simply uh, for our viewers, what are the signs and the symptoms that they should be alert to uh, so that they get in there quickly and get the treatment that they need? Yeah, usually lymphoma, we say, is a cancer of the lymph nodes. And so, well, that's hard because there's lymph nodes literally normally all throughout the body, but normally they're small. They're about the size of a, a nickel, you know, a small grape or so. But typically lymphoma, what happens with Burkitt's, it's that fast growing. So it literally can double in 24 hours. But usually it's over weeks, maybe months, it'll be a persistently enlarging lymph node. Now, I don't want everyone to think they have lymphoma because when you get sick, you've probably your lymph nodes in di different places get enlarged. So, but if it goes away in a few days, that's highly likely not going to be cancer or lymphoma for that matter. But if it's increasing over certainly weeks and months, it would be something definitely to get in to see the general doctor and they can evaluate it from there. And it doesn't have to be painful. A lot of times it's that painless swelling, but it's swelling that persists, doesn't go away, not associated with a cold or infection. Exactly. So now you're not just helping people with the state of the art and giving patients the best treatment. You're actually working on advancing the science. Could you tell us about the project that you're working on? Uh, sure, absolutely. And it's and it's tricky. Uh, there, there's so many different aspects of research. You have the what we call bench or laboratory research where a lot of it's spent studying that DNA or genetics of the cancer cells and trying to see why are they resistant, number one, and number two, okay, how can we design new therapies that are really targeted and, and to go right after that specific lymphoma subtype. So. The, the one clinical research project we have, and it's tough in general, we'll talk a little bit about, I think, clinical research, but especially for rare diseases, 
because if there's only a couple thousand diagnosed, it's, it's a little harder to study. But our research project, we took that general cure rates that we talked about, and we looked at it, we took a standard treatment, a standard chemotherapy regimen, and we, said, we looked at it and we said, well, how can we make it better? Uh, number one, and, and that's, a, I think, a general theme and goal of research is how can we make the research or the outcomes better, but I think it's fair to say we're also looking at how can we make it less toxic, less side effects, not only acute, but long term. So it, it wasn't a real complicated clinical trial. It was pretty straightforward where we took the basic chemotherapy and added in special, somewhat higher doses, this rituximab, something that's been approved since 1997, but I think partly because it's so rare, has not been studied that frequently, very uncommonly, in fact, in Burkitt's lymphoma. So we basically were looking at higher dose of this rituximab, which is now standard in most B-cell lymphomas, looked at it in Burkitt's lymphoma, and then we also looked at a different, one of, replaced one of the chemotherapies to hopefully make, one of the chemotherapies can uh, rarely, thankfully, but have some cardiac toxicity. So we try to use a newer drug to hopefully be less toxic in that fashion. And you're doing a couple of things that I think are special. One is, as great as Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center is, you're not doing it alone. You're collaborating. And how important is that for the benefit of patients? Critical. And, and I think we got caught up in, in sometimes uh, a few decades ago of all the, all the universities and everyone working in their own silos. And I think we've really come to realize, especially over the last five to ten years, that we're not going to make progress that way. We, we have to collaborate, in other words, work together. And you can imagine that's for, for most cancers and lymphomas, but God forbid a really rare one like this where it's only 1%. And so we realize that. And as you had mentioned, there's, there's a lot of talented scientists and, and lymphoma specialists in Chicago that, believe it or not, before, before this project had not worked together too much, especially on a clinical trial. And so we really, I think it's been over five years now, we pulled all our resources, literally met in rooms together thinking, okay, how can we attack this rare disease, improve the outcomes? And we worked together, planned the clinical trial, and it's about 80% done now. Uh, it's been open about four years because, yeah, if Northwestern would have tried to do this on our own, it would have taken 20, 25 years and uh, things pass us by. And, and by and people pulling our resources, away. they do. And, and uh, things go move on. So we said, let's work together, give up maybe some personal glory, so to speak, and just team effort, literally, as, as uh, not only uh, 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 a city, but also as a general area, because we actually expanded out. We, didn't, we started with just Chicago, but we've added a few other institutions in the Midwest, Case Western in Cleveland, as well as Washington University in St. Louis is part of the project too, all working the same effort improve the outcome and cure of this disease. And it really hastens the pace of development, which is very important because time really is a matter of life and death to a lot of people. The other thing that I think is a little bit unique, we, we talk about everything, you know, the budget, uh, governmental budgets, trillions and billions and hundreds of millions, but lymphoma is a disease where I, I think you could say just millions of dollars can have a major impact. And for somebody like you doing a study like that, a few hundred thousand dollars, for example, can save a lot of lives. It's unbelievable how much it can. And I think that's the, maybe the poorly understood, e even from a lot of doctors, not in research, but just generally speaking is, is well, how do we get clinical research done? And unfortunately, like anything else in life, it, if you want to do a clinical trial, it costs some degree of money to make sure every, uh, the data is safe, there, everything's happening correctly. and. For clinical research, it's uh, you try to find the sources. A, a lot of times, we we partner with our industry colleagues, with drug companies. They they we work together, but it's hard because cancer centers and even universities don't have a lot of free money to do clinical research. And so, as investigators, we talk to industry. We try to apply for grants to the government, but it's it's very competitive. We we try hard to to work, but everyone's trying. And and as you mentioned. It's unbelievable how much philanthropic support and donations help things like, gener generally speaking, clinical research. It, it honestly, just like you said, makes an enormous difference. And that's where all of us come in. That's where organizations like Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation and where you guys come in 
because our nickels, our dimes, our dollars added together really make a huge difference. It's another situation we can't sit back, wait for the drug companies. We can't sit back, wait for the government. There's actions that we can take. And what we're going to do, Dr. Evans, is we're going to put uh, in the coming uh, week or so uh, some information about your research project on chicagobloodcancer.org so people can learn more about it. Uh, we're going to have you on our board because we think what you're doing is extremely important. And uh, we're going to continue working day after day, week after week, which is what Charlene's out there now putting another initiative together because it saves lives. And so, uh, and that's what this really is all about. And as the doctor said, not just new treatments uh, for the sake of new treatments, but better treatments that are more effective, that are less toxic because Absolutely. a lot of folks succumb to side effects of treatment or they're too old or generally in poor health and can't withstand the treatment. And so that makes a difference too. Very important. But we want, we want our cake and eat it too. We want highly effective therapy and least amount of side effects. Absolutely. Dr. Evans, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, all of you, don't forget, if you want to reach us, chicagobloodcancer.org or 888 We want to thank uh, the law firm of Meckler, Bulger, Tilson, Merrick, and Pearson. It's their generous support that makes this program possible. Uh, and they are uh, rated now first tier in employment and insurance law nationally in the new U.S. News and World Report rankings. We thank them. We thank our folks at Can TV. Next week, we're putting together a special finality, finale with Dr. Stephanie Gregory of Rush University Medical Center. Until next week, everybody, thank you for joining us on Battling and Beating Cancer, and good night.